I'm Jennifer Musa from SUNY Broome, and I'm really happy to be here with you this morning. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about a very special class that I teach at Broome, um, and I'm going to tell you about what happened to some of the dresses um, that came with us to Haiti. So the course that I teach is called Health for Haiti, and I co-teach it with Professor Maureen Hankin, who is the Chair of Dental Hygiene at SUNY Broome. So we teach it together. And it's a real class. It's a four-credit class that students register for. Uh, they pay tuition. We have some class meetings. We do a lot of fundraising. But most of the course takes place uh, over a 10-day trip to Haiti. And I'd like to say that all the fundraising we do goes towards our projects in Haiti. The students pay all of their own travel expenses, um, which is quite a sacrifice for some of our students. So you might wonder, why Haiti? I don't know if you know very much about Haiti, but Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and the people in Haiti live in just devastating poverty. Um, they suffered a terrible earthquake about five years ago, which made a, a very bad situation even worse. Um, the people in Haiti don't have the things that we sometimes take for granted, like enough food to eat, um, clean water to drink, the opportunity to go to school and get an education, and the opportunity to go to the doctor um, when they're sick. There are also aren't public services in Haiti the way that we have them here. So nobody comes and picks up the garbage, there's no mail service. Um, some of the things, again, that we're used to living in a country like the United States, they don't have in Haiti. And you see lots of garbage there. It's really not a very safe environment for people. Also, there's many people in Haiti, especially children, that don't even have appropriate clothing to wear. Um, there's some children that maybe just have a shirt or a pair of shorts and nothing else at all to wear. And many people also um, don't have a, a proper place to live. There are people who are still living in tents five years after the earthquake. And even people that have a shelter to live in, a lot of times those shelters aren't things that would be appropriate for people to live in. Um, they're, they're not even as nice as what we might use as a garden shed or something. So Haiti needs a lot of help, and that's why we teach this course there. And again, it's a service course, so we go there to be of service to people um, however we can. And I don't have a lot of time to talk to you this morning about what we do, but I just want to tell you about a few things um, that we work on while we're in Haiti. One thing that the students do is a food distribution in a place called City Soleil. City Soleil is the largest slum in the Western Hemisphere, and there's over a half a million people living in eight square miles. There's no running water, there's no sewage. Uh, it's it's uh, really a, a very difficult place for these people to be. And our students raise money um, to buy some food, to do a food distribution there. And while we're in Haiti, they bag up the food. We buy rice, beans, fish, and oil. And while we're there, we were able to distribute 500 bags of food um, to widows and their family families. Uh, we gave out over 500 families a bag of food. Some of these women walked hours to be there to pick up the bag of food. And depending on the size of the family, this is enough food to last them for maybe even a couple of weeks. We also had several free health clinics in Haiti. We work with a Haitian doctor. His name is Dr. Robinson. And he works with our students. Some of the students are health science students, so they're going to school to be nurses and doctors. And they help the doctor at the health clinics. We collect over-the-counter medical supplies before we go to Haiti and distribute them at the clinics. And we use some of the money that we raise to buy prescription medications. We saw over 300 patients at our free clinics in Haiti, and we helped the doctor dispense over 1,500 prescriptions. We've also started to keep some medical records for the people that we serve in these communities. Many of them had never, ever been measured their height or their weight. They didn't even know how to step on a scale, and our students had to show them how to do that. We also have a couple of projects where we're trying to install solar power. Many people in Haiti have no electricity, and even if there is electricity, it's only on for a couple hours a day. It's very unreliable. One area we worked in is a very rural area. Um, it took us about four and a half hours to get there, even though it was only about 70 miles away from where we were staying. Um, very bad dirt roads to get there, and these people have no electricity at all. All they had was an old gas generator, which broke a lot, and it was very hard to get gas. So 
So working um, with Dr. Gabe Knuff from ETM Solar Works, uh, we raised money to buy solar power equipment and the students installed a freestanding solar power system on the only building that this community actually has. And in a minute I'll tell you what they're using that solar power for. But this is the first time these people could even have a light at night. We also have a very large clean water project going on. This is the same rural community. It's called Grand Saline. And these people have no access to clean water. They suffer terrible diseases that comes from drinking the water. This picture I'm showing you is a river there. This is their only source of water, and it's contaminated by human and animal waste and garbage. Um, they get sick a lot, and many people here have died from cholera, uh, which is a, a disease that you can get from drinking dirty water. We were very fortunate to have an incredible donation from the Paul Corporation in Cortland, New York. This is a microfiltration water system. It's a state-of-the-art system that is the same that they would sell to a municipal customer. If this system is run at full capacity, it could uh, provide enough clean water for 17,000 people. So we've completed two phases of installing that system. Hopefully within the next month or so, it will be up and running, and this community will have clean water to drink for the first time. We've had a lot of help from other companies in getting our equipment there. Uh, it hasn't been an easy thing, but we're very close <laughs> to having this project um, be, be work up and working. And then uh, another project that we have, we call Bridge to Haiti. Um, Bridge to Haiti is where we're setting up small computer labs in urban and rural areas in Haiti. Um, there, as I said, there's not a lot of opportunity for education there. And the opportunity to use a computer and learn a little bit about uh, how to do things like write a letter, connect to the internet, uh, is really important for these people. And so we've set up three small computer labs. We've partnered with a program called Bridging the Digital Divide, which works in this area to teach computer literacy. And we're using their materials, which have been translated into Haitian Creole, which is what the people in Haiti speak. Um, and our students are teaching some computer literacy. We've hired teachers, established internet connections, and there's ongoing classes there. We've also partnered with some young children uh, in the Endicott area who raised money to buy digital cameras for the kids in Haiti. And they're kind of creating a sort of a digital pen pal program where they can share information. This particular project is a project that grew out of a request from the community. And that's really what service learning is about. You have to find out from the community what they need. When I met these people and saw that they didn't have water, they didn't have enough food, they didn't have enough clothing, I would have never thought about bringing computers. Um, but that's what they asked for. And when you see the looks on these children's faces, um, you can see how important this is. And with the internet connection, we're literally connecting them to the rest of the world for the first time. So that brings me to um, the real reason that I'm here. Um, you will notice maybe in this picture that some of our computer students are looking a little better dressed uh, than they were before we went in January. Uh, and that is because of the wonderful group you have here, the so-and-sos, who work so hard to make these beautiful dresses. And I had the opportunity to come by um, before I went to Haiti in January, and we received over 100 dresses um, that I took with us to Grand Saline, and we distributed the dresses there. Um, and I have some pictures to show you of some young ladies in Grand Saline wearing the beautiful dresses. Again, many of these children do not have clothes to wear, so uh, I can't tell you how excited they were and how proud we were to bring these beautiful dresses um, with us to Grand Saline to, to share with the community. Uh, and and uh, one one other little uh, side note to tell you that is probably not what you expected when you were praying over your beautiful dresses here at church. When we were on our way to Grand Saline, as I said, it's a really difficult trip. We were about 15 minutes away from our destination and we came upon this group carrying a homemade stretcher. On that stretcher was a woman in labor with her first child. Um, they had been walking for over three hours in the hot sun. And we were over an hour from any kind of medical care, even driving. But we were going to meet Dr. Robinson, who we work with. Uh, and so we somehow squeezed this woman on the bus. 
uh, that we were riding in. It was really more of a van. And we made it to Dr. Robinson. We pushed a couple of wooden benches together. Uh, and a very short time later, she delivered a beautiful baby boy uh, with the help of our students. <laughs> so it was a very exciting day for our class that was there. After this baby was born, um, they asked, is there anything that we can wrap this baby in? Because again, these people really have next to nothing. And so uh, you can see we wrapped her in one of the dresses from the so-and-sos. <laughs> so this is a little baby boy. Um, you probably didn't expect him to be <laughs> having one of your, your beautiful dresses. Um, but that was, dress was used to welcome this new life into the world. Uh, and it was the first thing uh, that the baby was wrapped in. And here's a picture of the very proud grandma uh, holding her new grandson wrapped in one of your beautiful dresses. So uh, again, it was really a blessing to have those. So thank you from my entire House for, House for Haiti class. Uh, this is them spelling out Haiti um, in one of our group pictures. Again, we were so proud to take these, these dresses with us. And if I could just um, leave you with the thought, uh, you know, these children really are the future of Haiti. It is so difficult to help Haiti. There are so many challenges. Um, it can be overwhelming. When we arrived in Grand Saline, there was over 400 children waiting for us, and there's, there's many more uh, in the area. Um, but, you know, one small thing at a time really can make a difference for these people. Uh, you know, Mother Teresa said, we can't all do great things, um, but we can do small things with great love. And I think together, if we work on doing small things, we can really make a difference um, for these people that, that are, don't have the kind of things that we are so blessed to have in our, our country. So thank you again for the beautiful dresses. Um, it made such a difference for these people, and it really was an honor to bring them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.